Hey there, welcome back. Today we're gonna take a look at alpine climbing equipment. Specifically, we're gonna take a look at how to pack for a grade five alpine climbing objective here in the Pacific Northwest, where the objective isn't overly technical, technically difficult, but it may involve some pitches of rock, or steep snow, or even low angle ice. And the weather is okay. So in the forecast, um, it's unlikely that precipitation will come in but yet we still wanna have some level of protection in the event there is rain or there is uh, wind so that we're not freezing cold and left exposed to the elements. So let's take a closer look at all the gear and food that I'm gonna pack and what size of a backpack I wanna put it in. Now, when I'm talking about a grade five objective, I'm specifically talking about objectives where I need to camp along the route. So there might be a bivy ledge separated by fifth class climbing or fourth class climbing on both sides where it's not possible to bail down to a better camping area or a group campsite, something like that. Okay, so the first piece of equipment we're gonna take a look at is the backpack. And in this case, I'm using a Mountain Equipment Tupliac 45 Plus. It's a pretty simple Alpine pack. It has a rigid board in the back that's sort of floppy until it's packed tightly, um, but not a, you know like a spring steel frame or anything. A lot of times I prefer spring steel frames if I'm carrying heavy loads, but this pack seems to do a pretty good job if it's packed well um, at carrying a heavy load. It has some removable hip fins on it, which is nice. So when I'm wearing my climbing harness, I can remove those and those don't interfere with my gear loops on the harness. And you'll see I've also created a, a lid. This pack doesn't come with a lid, um, but just because uh, when I'm guiding, I carry a little bit more material and having quick access to a few things is helpful. I've created a lid for it. When I'm actually doing the pitches of fifth class climbing, I typically have that lid removed and either stuffed in the pack with my snacks and other accessibles inside of it. Or um, if I'm establishing a base camp and then leaving and doing an overnight on the route between the base camp, I may leave that lid behind. Just depends on the particular objective. Looking over here, we've got a trekking pole. That's not gonna go in the pack. That's gonna come up with me uh, to a base camp. Um, I'll usually leave that behind at base camp. I, I prefer not to climb pitches of fifth class with trekking pole, but some descents, like if I was coming down from uh, Mount Stewart, for example, a trekking pole could be really nice, but I might choose a, a lighter pole. Typical, typically, I haven't in the past, though. Usually that stays behind. Um, two pairs of socks. One pair is pretty lightweight, comes up just above the ankle. The other is a little bit longer, still very lightweight. Um, but comes up a little higher than above the ankle, um, and that prevents a little bit of shin bang. But the type of footwear that I've chosen here, these are Scarpa Zodiac Techs. They climb rock remarkably well for a boot. It's almost like a, an overbuilt approach shoe. And uh, if you see on the back here, there's still a heel welt, so they accept semi-automatic crampons. Um, got good sticky rubber on the bottom, and uh, I found they're pretty warm as well, so I guide on like Mount Baker with these. I've even got it on Mount Rainier with these, but only in extremely warm conditions. I think it's, uh, it's really pushing it if you start guiding um, higher objectives. Um, I've got a pair of rain pants here. Um, I will typically have these in my pack um, just in case, but you know, I find uh, soft shells here in the Northwest are a lot of times not enough because rain can come for a long period of time. Um, so I do bring rain pants. These are uh, Outdoor Research Helium pants. They're very, very lightweight. Um, I may not wear them unless it gets windy or cold or if it starts raining. They might stay in my pack, but it's a good, good piece of kit to have. I've got some outdoor research. Uh, I think they're called, they're similar to the Dragon Pant, but they're a ski version. Um, they're stretchy soft shell and they have these nice side zips here. So if I'm um, hiking in in warm conditions, I can vent those easily. Um, but they're really wind resistant. Got some good pockets for stashing snacks. So I really like those. Uh, typically that green t-shirt there I'll be wearing on the, the hike up to base camp and for the majority of the lower elevations. Um, and then I can start adding layers. So you can see I've got this white sun shirt here um, just behind it. And then I have this red grid fleece. It's an old uh, outdoor research grid fleece. That's a hybrid jacket. And then I have a Rab Xenon is the, the red jacket there. I am here in the northwest i am always using um, synthetic jackets if i'm going to be uh, on a route that has ridges where i'm exposed and really can't get out of the weather um, down can be quite dangerous actually if you're exposed and in the weather for a long time and it starts to wet out and it's not extremely resistant to uh, weathering 
And then I have a pretty lightweight rain shell here. This is just a uh, La Sportiva uh, simple jacket here. Um, I just bring this rain jacket. I don't bring an additional wind shell. I just use this rain jacket in the event that it's windy. Um, it's not super breathable, but I find with the cooler temperatures we typically have in the Alpine, it's not that big of a deal. And I'll usually spray this with uh, water treatment beforehand. Sometimes it's like um, an outdoor um, furniture waterproofing. Um, or a lot of times uh, Nick Wax, which is a great company because they're also environmentally friendly in their products. Then I have a simple um, Mountain Hardware fleece cap here. Um, fits really well under a helmet. That's really all I need. Um, typically the, the Alpine rock routes and uh, complex Alpine climbing objectives that are not on Mount Rainier, um, they're not particularly cold, um, unless I'm doing something that involves more mixed climbing in early season, but summer objectives seem pretty good with that. And then I have a, an outdoor research um, uh, neck gaiter here. And uh, especially right now, COVID-19 has been a problem this climbing season. So that's also what I'm using as my mouth cover um, in the event that we're near other groups. Moving over here, um, just a little quick overview here. Let's zoom in now. Uh, this is all I carry for water these days. This is a, a HydroPack Seeker three liter bladder. And uh, I may not always fill it up all the way up. I might just have, you know, for the approach, maybe um, half a liter in there, especially if there's creeks along the way. So I'm not carrying too much weight. And that's fitted with a uh, bee free filter, which filters down to 0.1 microns, which is pretty good. And so that integrates quite nicely. Um, that's made out of silicone, so you can put hot water in there. They don't recommend temperatures above, I think, like 140 degree Fahrenheit, but um, I found I can put a little bit of cold water in the bottom and then put really hot, almost boiling water in there. And uh, I haven't had any issues, and I've had that for a while. But uh, yeah, just know that there could be, a, could be an issue. But that's a nice uh, hydration system. I, I don't like hoses because I find once I pack everything in my lightweight pack, um, the hoses get kinked, and uh, it's more likely that you get ruptures and things like that when it's pressed against the back um, and sometimes people get really dehydrated because the bladders that have hoses being against your back they're not very accessible so I just fill that with exactly as much water as I need leave it at the top of my pack and then uh, I just refill from streams along the route as I go um, that's also really nice because if I encounter just like a drip or something like that a lot of times at bivvies you might need to melt snow but if there's a drip you can just gradually fill that up over the course of a few minutes and then uh, squeeze it right in your mouth with that filter and that's sufficient. This little red guy here is a pared down first aid kit. Um, if I'm establishing a base camp, I may have a bigger kit and leave a little bit behind in, uh, in base camp and then bring a pared down kit when I get on the more technical portion of the route, just depends. This biohazard bag is what I use to pack out my feces. So here in the Northwest, it's really important that we pack out our poop in a lot of locations. So not just my feces, but I also pack out toilet paper. Um, all of my trash comes out, everything else. Got a, a uh, Delorme inReach, now uh, Garmin owns inReach, and the devices are a little bit smaller, but that's what I'm using here for my emergency satellite communications um, in the event that I don't have cell reception. Headlamps, I find headlamps are actually really important, a very important piece of safety equipment. And so I have a, a highly water resistant, almost waterproof, extremely bright lamp from zebra light i think it's called the uh, mk4 and uh, it's 1200 lumens on its highest setting and it has a special battery um, and i carry a spare it's rechargeable so um, i just bring extra batteries into the field and i find it's a, about the same weight or even a little lighter than you know some of the popular maybe black diamond headlamps but significantly brighter and lasts longer and then because lighting is so important i also bring a, a backup headlamp in case my lamp fails, gets lost, or um, one of my guests has a failing headlamp or their lamp gets lost. Really important if you're navigating in, the, in big terrain at night um, to be able to get out of the mountains. And I have a spare charging bank. This one uh, charges my phone about one and a half times and the uh, battery life on my phone is quite good. So I find that sufficient for uh, this three day trip that I pack for here. Um, so it's mostly for my phone. I'm also using my phone for uh, GPS and uh, I will typically make sure that one of my guests also has a GPS app like Gaia Earth on their phone, and then both of us will have downloaded maps for offline use. Having a hard copy map is also you know, a, a really good idea. So a lot of times I'll print specific areas off of CalTOPO, and um, I'll stick that in uh, you know, a plastic sleeve that's used for portfolios, 
and then just tape the end. And that makes it pretty waterproof. It's quick, it's cheap. And uh, with Caltopo, you're only bringing what you need. So that's quite nice. You can also print out your specific route on the hard copy. And I've got some sunscreen, uh, two ounces or one and a half ounces there is more than enough for a three day trip with the amount of skin that I have exposed. Got some sunglasses in a case. These are um, uh, zebra lenses or zebra light, oh, excuse me, not zebra light lenses, standard zebra lenses. So that's nice because when storms move in, uh, these photochromatic lenses will lighten up and allow me to see pretty well still. Um, and then they'll darken if I'm, uh, you know, say in a bright, um, sunny glacier, something like that. And uh, that's sufficient eye protection for me that I don't need to bring uh, multiple lenses. And then this guy right here is my sleeping bag. Um, weather is supposed to be quite warm. So uh, it's a uh, 850 fill, 30 degree bag. My typical bag that I guide with is a 20 degree. So I'll swap between those two. But if you're gonna just purchase one bag and you know you're gonna be doing big roots, I would suggest like a, a feathered friends I think it's a hummingbird, like 20 degree bag, slim down, uh, very lightweight, packs down small. Um, and then, you know, that's gonna work for warmer warmer situations as well. But that's a, kind of a good bag to, to have for summer climbing specifically. Wouldn't wanna do it shoulder season or certainly not in the winter. You'd need something warmer. And then this is uh, just a piece of closed cell foam, you know, not very thick, um, that I've cut in the shape of my backpack. Um, and but folded it in half so it it's it's basically a bivy pad that I'm carrying with me an emergency bivy pad in the event that my air mattress here pops and um, I'm going pretty trimmed down I want a lightweight compact pack so this is just a half length um, x light that I'm using from uh, Thermarest and uh, I feel fine that's pretty good I'll you know sleep on this my my back, my hips go on that, and then my legs will go down and on my backpack. But certainly uh, a full length x light is isn't that much heavier or bulkier and is significantly more comfortable if you want a little bit better night's sleep. So um, if I was, say, a, the follower rather than the leader of the, those pitches, then I would probably opt for a full length pad. It's going to be a lot more comfortable for those nights. And then for shelter, you know, again, I mentioned that this is for a trip that has pretty good weather forecast, but it's still important that you bring some kind of protection. And uh, this is a silicone impregnated nylon tarp. Um, I think it weighs right around 12 ounces and it's large enough to get four people underneath it. But I find uh, it's a little small for four people if there's much wind. You need a little bit better coverage. So with, you know, two or three people underneath this, that works pretty well. And uh, the advantage of a tarp is you can set it up in kind of any, any terrain. It doesn't have to be flat like a tent would need to be. Um, and you can plug some cams in the rock and guy it out and get a really, really strong tarp setup. That's pretty wind resistant. I've had this thing in gusts up to 40 miles per hour and uh, that material is very, very strong. I'm not gonna say that it offers a comfortable night's sleep if it's windy because it flaps like crazy. So this should really be considered for a very uncomfortable sleepless night um, if it's gonna be windy and rainy. Um, if it's just a little windy, no rain, I would just not set it up. Um, and if uh, you think it might be windy and or rainy, um, then, uh, and it's likely, then I would opt for a tent, a lightweight tent, you know, like uh, the new uh, MSR Advance Pro 2, which is pretty good in the wind. Something like that would be good. Cooking, um, there's a lot of different options. You know, you could certainly bring a lighter weight stove than this in many conditions, but I'm gonna be melting snow and having an efficient uh, stove like this MSR reactor is nice because it means I have to bring less fuel for melting snow and it takes less time, which means more rest. And I've got two lighters for that. Um, I find uh, in terms of the amount of fuel I bring, if it's summer, so the temperatures are relatively warm and I'm not melting snow, then I budget about one and a half or 1.5 ounces of fuel per person per day. That's isobutane fuel specifically with this stove with the MSR reactor, which is fairly efficient. And if I'm melting snow, then for each day that I'm melting snow, um, so if I'm at a bivy and my primary water source is going to be snow nearby, then I budget three ounces per person per day of isobutane fuel for that. And that's summer. In the winter, I go to five ounces for isobutane or eight ounces if I'm using white gas. And then I've got uh, a just a little GSI bowl that's also my mug. So that's all I'm going to bring. Sometimes I won't even bring this. So, um, 
but just a little cup that I'm gonna use for everything. And then a long spoon, because I'm gonna be eating dehydrated meal packets. And then for uh, food, um, I've taken out some of the meals from one of these uh, meal packages here. And uh, I find it packs much better that way if I pack it separate. And then I packed some um, coconut oil as well, some two, two little sleeves of coconut oil. Sometimes I'll bring olive oil um, and to increase the calorie count. And then by repackaging things, taking out the oxygen absorbers, uh, I find it packs down much, much tighter in my pack, um, takes up way less room and I can get away with a smaller pack and it's just a, it's tighter when I'm climbing so it doesn't shift around quite as much. And that's my two dinners. Uh, I've got a three-day trip here. So a three-day trip will be two nights out. So I've got two dinner meals. And then I've also got two breakfasts down here. And then uh, I have three lunches. You'll see I've got some, a uh, little bit of Gatorade. I like hot Gatorade in the evening to recover sometimes after a big day. So I'll just pour that in thermos, or excuse me, in my cup with a little hot water. Got some Thai treat, drink mix and hot chocolate. Um, usually I bring a few more hot drinks than this. I just couldn't fi find them when I was setting up this video. So might have some herbal teas in there, some green tea. And then uh, lunches, I've got some nuts that I'm gonna divide up over my three lunches. So again, we're three day trips. We're coming out on the late morning of day three. So I might want some snacks for lunch on the way down. And uh, I've got a bunch of bars cause I can eat them on the go, but um, I haven't packed my sandwiches yet. So this will also include um, two sandwiches and usually I'll do like a bagel sandwich with salami and hummus and cream cheese and avocado so tons of fat um, and savory uh, sometimes I get sick of the, the uh, salami by the end of the season so then I usually just do rotisserie chicken and then shave it on there but I find um, sugars you know like a lot of these energy bars are really really sweet and um, you, when you're alpine climbing, you're not moving that fast, you know, even though in the movies we make it seem like we're just buzzing up these things. It's really fat intensive. So I actually prefer things like nuts and seeds and, uh, you know, nut butters are really good. And then, yeah, fatty sandwiches. And that's much better for the way that my body works. I typically metabolize a lot more fat and uh, sugar is kind of just too much for me. So you, good. it's good to know your body as well. Here's my breakfast. Um, one breakfast is a, I'm just gonna use my dehydrated meal pouch. So again, each of these dehydrated meals, I just pour into that pouch and I keep reusing that pouch for each of my meals. So I'm not bringing extra packaging. So I'll reuse it for that as well. And then this particular one here is a, a granola. So it might be a really big day um, or maybe we're short on fuel and I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to rehydrate things with hot water. So I'll just get cold water sometimes. And then this is a uh, coconut milk right here. So just between those two things, because coconut milk powder is so energy rich, it's mostly fat. Um, I can get quite a few calories, maybe 450 or 500 calories in that breakfast easily right there. We're gonna go take a look at our technical gear now. Um, I threw a few ropes down here just to show options. So this is a 60 meter single rope here. Um, that could be sufficient. Uh, the difficulty of a 60 meter single rope, if I have two guests that are climbing with me, is if the pitches are so difficult that we need to haul their backpacks, um, it can make hauling your, their backpacks a little more difficult with a single 60. So what I would do is fold that 60 meter rope in half, belay them simultaneously, and they can climb with their packs. Um, or sometimes I'll do, it's called the caterpillar technique, where I'll tie one of my guests into the middle of the rope, the other into the end and then I'll belay them one at a time, especially for the harder pitches, that's a good thing to do. But it takes a little finagling to get your packs up there if you're gonna to try to haul the pack for a harder pitch or two. Um, so it's worth considering bringing a tag line here. This is a wrap cord by Black Diamond. Um, and that would allow me to haul their backpacks. It also allows me the option, if we needed to bail, to repel a full 60 meters by repelling the full length of my 60 meter rope and then pulling the rope with my tag line. But of course that's quite heavy and bulky. So if I could avoid bringing that tag line, I would. And uh, nowadays there's this little gizmo over here, which is the, uh, oh, what is it called? The Beale Escaper. Um, and the Beale Escaper worked kind of like a Chinese finger trap and uh, will create a like, friction hitch on the end of this rope and allow you to repel a full 60 meters and still retrieve your rope um, in the event that you need to bail. 
it's mm, it's maybe not the safest thing to do so i wouldn't do it as your like go-to way of bailing in the mountains there's ways you can really mess that up and it could be catastrophic but um if you're doing an up and over trip you're trying to keep things light and uh bailing is unlikely um, but you want to have some security then that's not a bad thing to bring with you so if i had a choice i would opt to bring you know a single 60 meter and my Beal escaper uh, another option that i might choose is uh, maybe a 40 meter rope and the Beal escaper a 40 meter rope and i have a, a tagline a petzl tagline as well or um, 40 meter rope and another 40 meter rope paired together just depends on the terrain and how i want to manage it for equipment here, in terms of technical gear, I have a single number three Camelot, two number twos, two number ones, and then 1.75. Oh, I'm going to reduce that. This should be 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, and a rack of nuts there. Um, this is a, you know a typical rack when you can get away doing small pitches, typically 30 meters or less. Uh, the climbing isn't overly difficult. There might be lots of fourth class, and you're trying to go a little bit lighter. You know, a lot of people will bring just a single rack. Um, I will oftentimes bring doubles of the number two and the number one, which just gives me a little bit more option if I need to bail for some reason and leave gear behind. I have a little bit additional gear to, to bail. Um, and if I'm bailing just off a gendarme or something like that and land on the lower ridge and I still need to complete the lower ridge, I still have plenty of gear left over to do that. I have two cordelettes. I like cordelettes in the Alpine um, because they allow me to encircle horns and things like that, and I can cut them if need be for bale material. And I don't typically bring much for wrap rings um, because I have all these carabiners with me already, and I typically leave carabiners behind. But every once in a while, um, I, I will um, need to leave, uh, you know, like a, uh, a, sorry, I'm forgetting the name for it. A rapide behind and so um, I have one in my harness I'll show in a sec so uh, up here at the top other than the rack I have three locking carabiners I also have my guests bring additional locking carabiners um, it's good to have quite a few because in the event that I need to short rope uh, or attach someone um, you know it's short pitching or in the middle of the rope then they may need two locking carabiners just for that for one triple action locker so make sure my guests bring plenty or i provide them i have a micro traction there um, i typically only bring a micro traction if there's significant glacier travel or if i'm going to be hauling backpacks otherwise i'll just leave that thing at home and then i have a guide style uh, plaquette device this is a a black diamond guide atc and two locking carabiners one of them round stock to reduce friction as i pull the rope through the device and I've got a double length nylon runner that I can use as a leash um, for myself to attach to an anchor or as an extension for rappel, as well as an anchors. Got a lightweight nut tool. I typically will give nut tools to my guests as well. And I have a, a, a third hand there on a locking carabiner, lightweight Alpine style harness. This is a Petzl Sita. And then I have a little bail kit here. I've got a knife, a spare friction hitch, and then there's my, my rapide. Or quick link there okay and then chalk bag i typically don't bring a chalk bag in the alpine unless there's i know that there's quite steep pitches that might be a little bit greasy or might be a little warm but uh, i threw it in there just as a consideration if what you're climbing is difficult for you um, or the rock is a little slickery then it can make a pretty good difference actually got a nice hard helmet there i don't have the lightest weight helmet because i find they break a little bit easier but uh up to you personal preference and I've got full fingered belay gloves. I'll actually climb in these belay gloves through almost all the fourth and low fifth class terrain because I'm handling the rope a lot. And um, these particular gloves, these are like pretty affordable black diamond full finger belay gloves. I find I can climb in those pretty easily. Um, it allows me to handle the rope for terrain blaze a little better. Pair of climbing shoes, Mira's mm, not always my first choice for alpine climbing unless there's you know pitches of sort of steep technical face or thin finger crack. But these Mira's I've broken in so much and done so much multi pitch in them they're actually really comfortable. So I'm, it's important you choose a comfortable shoe um, for all day use and don't forget that you'll be standing in those shoes with an overnight pack on, which you may have never climbed with an overnight pack before and it can be awkward and make your feet you know 
flare out a little bit more than you might be used to. So consideration. A lot of people like Velcro um, shoes um, because they're easy on off, but just make sure you don't get any of those aggressive downturned bouldering shoes. That's gonna be awful. TC Pros are super popular because they're pretty comfortable all day trad climbing shoe. So um, that would be another option there. Crampons, I've got steel crampons. Um, for crampons, uh, on almost all the grade five Alpine objectives here in the Northwest, I bring steel because I might be climbing up and over Bergschrons, um, up you know, steep faces of crevasses or up gullies or runnels that could have ice in them and slipping is not an option. A lot of times I'm climbing those pitches quickly, potentially soloing those pitches in certain circumstances. So I wanna make sure I have good purchase. These are just a lightweight pair. Um, a lot of times uh, I opt to bring a hybrid pair of crampons where I've replaced the, the back heel portion with um, aluminum and I find that works pretty well. You know, I just wouldn't necessarily want aluminum front points as the guide because um, I'm not gonna be on top rope while I'm leading up these, these pitches. And then I have a super small, compact, lightweight ice axe. Um, but it's got a nice steel head. I can still pound pickets in with this thing really well. Um, if I need to climb pitches of steeper ice, uh, this thing is plenty sharp enough. I find it climbs almost like an ice tool. The ice did a really good job with this thing. And um, it's got a, a uh, sliding hand pummel. So it can protect my fingers if I need to climb something a little steeper to get up and over a, a steep part of a crevasse. And uh, you'll notice I've got pick protectors on there. You know, I might not always bring pick protectors out into the field with me, but um, I can actually get this pack, this uh, ice axe is small enough to go all the way inside my backpack. So if I've got a lot of pitches of fifth class climbing, I'll just shove this in my pack close to the frame with the pick protectors on, and then I can close my pack up entirely as long as I'm not doing a lot of transitions from snow to rock. That works pretty well. And then uh, back over here, I just have a little bit of a, an away pile. Um, so a sweatshirt and some flip-flops for when I get back to the car. Usually I have an extra t-shirt in there, a bag of chips, um, and a spare water bottle all stays in the car and usually a, an extra charger for my cell phone. So hopefully that gives you a really good idea about what to pack for a grade five Alpine route, something like out of Boston Basin, maybe North Ridge of Forbidden would be a good example or the Northwest face of Forbidden. Um, would also be a re really great example of times I might use a kit like this. And uh, some things might be changed. You know, if they're doing the North face of Shuxon, I might want a separate tool there. Uh, so just keep in mind, this is an example of what you might pack, but not what you should pack all the time. Hopefully this has been super helpful for you. It's been fun for me.